I'm Father David Collins, the chair of the working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, and a professor in the history department. For those of you who are returning, thank you for returning. For those of you who are new, welcome to this, our first afternoon uh, session uh, in our symposium in commemoration of Emancipation Day. Uh, to introduce our next speaker, allow me to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor, Professor Marcia Chatelaine, who is also a member of the working group. Thank you for joining us for our second half of the Emancipation Day celebration. It is with great honor and pleasure that I introduce um, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kimberly Juanita Brown, who's an assistant professor at Mount Holyoke College. Kimberly is the nation's leading scholar on African Americans and visual culture. She is a graduate of Yale's PhD program in African American and American Studies and has hold, held several prestigious fellowships including the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship and the Mellon Fellowship. Kimberly's leadership in the field of African American visual culture is best seen in her organization and direction of The Dark Room, which is an internationally renowned working group that looks at the question of race and the visual in a number of forms. She's an incredible photographer, teacher, scholar, and her first book, The Repeating Body, Slavery's Visual Resonance in the Contemporary, was published by Duke University Press. Kimberly Juanita Brown. Only half of what Marcia said. It's true. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to start by thanking Georgetown University, especially Marcia Chatlin, the Department of History, English, African American Studies, and the Program in Women and Gender Studies for inviting me to speak with you today. I'm just checking. It's not like I don't trust technology, but I don't trust technology. <laughs> Everyone can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay. In Toni Morrison's novel, Jazz, the protagonist with the easily corruptible name of Violet moves back through her memories, and she thinks to the moment shortly before her mother's suicide. She asks herself what it was, what was quote, the one and final thing, end quote, that her mother could not endure or repeat. She tries to see it with her eyes, locate it within her own memory. With the coupling of endure and repeat, Violet proceeds to frame her life through a muted management of the burdens her mother discards in death and the expectation of her own self-retrieval. Repetition as dangerous endurance, then, offers Morrison's protagonist multiple delineations bringing her back to that single question. She does not find the one and final thing, because there is not one thing, but a totality of things contributing to her mother's willful removal. They begin in slavery and before her mother comes into existence. This is the place where black women's endurances have been used against them. And their bare survival is reconfigured as a strength that cannot be altered, damaged, or destroyed. Violet's mother, ever cognizant of her deployment in this cycle of uninhabitable space drowns herself in a well in order to make her pain visible. My book is haunted by a single question. Why have representations of black women been resistant to the concept of a body's inherent vulnerability? The concept of a body's vulnerability, that it is made of flesh and bone and that it can be broken, is still a difficult rendering in the context of slavery, gender, and representation. My book focuses on the legacies of slavery in the Atlantic world and the imagistic imperatives that repeat and recycle disparate narratives of black female power contributing to a multidimensional failure of seeing. I argue that after the 1960s, images from the black diaspora articulate a collective redefinition of how the slave body figures in the world of the black Atlantic, one that negates the possibility of gendered victimization. Black women are situated at the center of this redefinition, reliant on proximity and violence, resistance and reformulation to render black subjectivity. This is a diasporic phenomenon, 
one that is mediated culturally, especially as the memory of slavery is reinvented as a repeating mythology of black women's power. As James Elkins argues in The Object Stares Back, we prefer to have bodies in front of us or in our hands, and if we cannot have them, we continue to see them as after images or ghosts. Therein lies the difficulty in attempting to wrest black women from the trace of the corporeal. Where could they go without bringing the past along with them? Where would we let them go without our perception of their body's utility in an ocular world? Part of the work of this book is to make legible the multiple investments in hypervisibility black women cannot escape in artistic attempts at using opacity, framing, fragmentation, and repetitions of the visual to illustrate a desire for black women's full humanity. This book attempts to make the practice of looking a part of the way that we visualize the memory of slavery, as it was a process of racialized and gendered visibility and dependent upon structured measures of looking, divergent and recycling. This divergence informs all interracial intra power relations and all attempts at resistance are filtered through a distorted lens and an exceedingly harmful gaze. The result is a heightened reliance on the memory of black women's corporeal success and erasure of their subjugation under slavery. Arna Bontemps 1936 novel Black Thunder is an early example of this success. As Juba, girlfriend of the fictional protagonist Gabriel Prosser, is whipped after she is sus suspected of planning an, ins an insurrection. Sorry. Highly sexualized and brutal, the scene nonetheless leaves the reader with the idea that for Juba, there is no such thing as physical or emotional pain. She didn't speak, she didn't even flinch, Bontomps writes. Although the passage states that her thighs were raw, like cut beef and bloody, Juba remains stoic, uttering not a word. By the time the unnamed narrator in John Edgar Wideman's The Cattle Killing witnesses a slave woman enter a body of water with a dead white child in her arms, he is convinced that she survives an elongated immersion into the lake. He is so committed to that belief that he simply watches her vanish, expecting her imminent return. But return she does not, and the narrator spends much of the rest of the novel seeking out women who remind him of, the, of this resistant African spirit, that's what he calls her, whom he believes treads death only to be born again in another woman's body. We think about slavery the way we think about black people in pain, infrequently. For those of us who work on the slave system and its legacies, attempting to illustrate this pain is an exercise in frustration. A glance at any archive, including the one being discussed here at Georgetown, is a way to engage the humanity located there. The kinship networks and familial structures, the enormity of loss and the longing for a better world. Always, of course, open to interpretation, the details of any archive of slavery necessitate deep looking, ocular vigilance, and the courage to see what is already there. Visual image makers attempt to see what is already there, often using self-portraiture photography to mark out a place of performative concealment within the photographic frame, disallowing the mandates of objectification to control their bodies. You see an image? It's a blank screen before, so you didn't miss anything. But now there's an image. Is that a blank screen? Blank screen. See an image? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The images insist on a process of collective self-retrieval that has black female subjectivity at its center, but also enables that subjectivity to use repetition as a layering mechanism. When Carrie Mae Weems uses her own body to enter the space of Louisiana's plantation history, as she does in her 2003 series, The Louisiana Project, she offers the viewer a guide and an escort through the corridors of slavery's past. Using her own body, she manages the engagement of slavery's fissures, slavery's contemporary impact against black women's bodies. My project layers what I call the contingent imagery of late contemporary Afro-diasporic literature and visual culture. The reliance on narratives of temporal shifting that coalesce around slavery's remains. 
Octavia Butler's novel, Kindred, is an obvious example of this. As the protagonist's body is pulled through time to save her future self from a past obliteration. In one of Carrie Mae Weems' more provocative examinations of creation, subjugation, and the continuing conundrum of DNA, she engages in a genealogical trace that is historical, imagistic, and national. She attempts to see what is already there. The fifth panel of a six-panel series called The Jefferson Suite is the only one that includes a representation of Thomas Jefferson and his slave Sally Hemings as the foci of the frame. Jefferson's quill pen draws the viewer's eye to the center of the frame as it appears that he creates Hemings out of the recesses of some previous declaration, over certain bodies, out of others. While both subjects have their backs to the viewer, Jefferson's stance is free and open, intimated by the position of his arm and the quill, the apparatus of his legibility. Weems as Hemings represents self-portraiture's resurrecting possibilities within a black Atlantic self-reflective imperative. Arms crossed in front and with her head facing the direction of a window the viewer cannot see. The faint appearance of light the only indication of a reprieve from total enclosure. Weems offers the slight inference of a failure of communication between them. Not just quill against gesture, Jefferson is illustrated as fully clothed, while Hemings's shoulders and arms are bare, an errant shoulder strap either absent-mindedly or purposely drawn down, illustrating the framing mechanism's perspective of choice. If, as Sadia Hartman claims, quote, the discourse of seduction obfuscates the primacy and extremity of violence in master-slave relations, end quote, Weems as Hemings delineates this concept as a failure of the archive, or an available archive that others refused to see. The Jefferson Suite illustrates racial ambiguity, cauterizing it to the slave system Thomas Jefferson symbolized through rhetorical inconsistency, lust, and lineage. Here, suite connotes an interior private space where lovers come together, as in a hotel suite. And I did look it up, and there is a Jefferson Suite at the Mandarin Hotel in DC. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, I was curious. A connected set of musical notes or chords in its auditory configuration, or even a pleasing smell or, or taste, sweet. If we think of the Jefferson suite and the bodies presented as types, collected and cataloged like the human and animal possessions marked in Jefferson's famous farm book, the suite becomes an ironic play on words. The sweetness dissipates, and so, um, Sally Hemings is located in the farm book, famously, and that is in the Massachusetts Historical Society. So the family donated it to Massachusetts, and I suspect it's because Sally Hemings is there in that book, and that's where she's listed, along with the animals, and her births are also listed. What remains, though, but it does exist, so <laughs> you can go look at it. Um, what remains, though, is the, que the question of affect and effect, the sentimental attachments of the visual and the familial, and their lingering imaginaries. Severing the viewer's ocular comportment while making malleable the corporeal dimensions of slavery's legacy, the Jefferson suite contains the delineations of the evidentiary photograph, linking it to past presidents and plantations, science, possession, and lineage. That Hemings's body is the text upon which democracy stands and modernity forms allows Weems the ability to perform a post-emancipation declaration of slave visibility. And so when I was a graduate student, a fairly famous Africanist historian gave a talk at Yale, and I was avoiding representations of Sally Hemings, but he said, if we think about Thomas Jefferson as the father of American democracy, we must think about Sally Hemings as the mother of American democracy. And that day I decided I would be working on Sally Hemings. With her back turned to the viewer, Jefferson's articulation and the mismanagement of history, Weems as Hemings seeks to interrogate the place of the known historical archive and its always embattled counter-construction. Using Hemings and her famous master as symbolic precursors to photography's duplicating prerogatives, Weems's self-portrait underscores the contemporary obsession with DNA as biological proof along with its concomitant imagery, pre-photographic temporally, but inferred with a force of visuality all its own. 
to envision then slave subjectivity within the structure of slave agency and limited mobility is to splice the narrative and reorganize it. For this, a negotiation of word and image brings the body into focus, brings history into the frame, and whether the work is literary or visual, the pattern of repetition remains the same. For poet Lucille Clifton, Sally Hemings' now famous history contributes to the desire to situate her body at a sexual crossroads between power and possibility. In her poem, Monticello, the speaker begins with a history which places the slave mother as the human landscape of Thomas Jefferson's ultimate possession. Sally Hemings, the history begins, slave at Monticello, bore several children with bright red hair. In the casualness of the poem's historical background, Clifton does a great deal of cultural work. She sets the poem on the grounds of Jefferson's beloved plantation, Monticello, essentially bastardizing the property and marking it as part and parcel of a larger process of lawful but egregious corporeal use. The marked children with bright red hair are offered as the product of both slave and master, the imagistic vicinity necessary for the subtleties of slave life to be reproduced decade after decade through slave progeny. And Jefferson is not anomalous in his compulsions. He is ordinary. Sally Hemings is the after image of the white father before her and the white grandfather before him. Jefferson is just last in a line of chromosomal, Im chromosomal imprints linking slaves and masters. And so Sally Hemings' grandmother arrives on John Whale's plantation already pregnant by Captain Hemings. He wants to purchase her. So she arrives on the ship pregnant. John Wales does not allow her to be sold to Captain Hemings. That's why they have that name. He keeps her because she's pregnant and she will get him more money. And then he impregnates the daughter she's pregnant with later. Clifton's Monticello, a single stanza piece consisting of four lines of verse, places the former president in contradiction with himself as the icon of tormented slave ownership. God declares no independence. Here come the sons from this black Sally, branded with Jefferson hair. Clifton hints at the power dimensions of Jefferson as a God figure who was not benevolent enough to declare independence for his slave. Instead, he declared his own independence onto her body, his will into her flesh, and branded her with his biological legacy. And so the, the person who did the DNA test, who has recently passed away, when he was asked what he was surprised by, he wasn't surprised that Jefferson was connected to Sally Hemings through her children. He was surprised that the Jefferson descendants allowed him to use their DNA. The poem notes the irony of Jefferson's family history since no sons, no heirs, born to Jefferson and his wife, Martha, survived into adulthood. The president's only sons were through Hemings, the black Sally of folklore and defamation, the dusky Sally of slave era fantasy and fault, Sally the seductress, the imagined sexual aggressor by whom Jefferson found himself enslaved. And I'm just reading out of the 18th and 19th century narrative concerning this, which doesn't actually shift until after the DNA evidence comes out. Hemings provides a compelling point of representational binary pairings. She is imagined as both slave and free, subjugated and powerful, child and woman, black and white, hypervisible and invisible. The visualization of Hemings' near white, maternally prolific body reverses the power structure of Thomas Jefferson's slave plantation, inverting the dimensions of their relationship. Purchased in the slave market to a total stranger, or in the case of Sally Hemings, inherited as the known product of previous sexual indiscretions, a slave woman, as Bell Hooks reminds us, could not look to any group of men, white or black, to protect her against sexual exploitation. Half-white children in southern households, according to Deborah Gray White, told a story of a white man's infidelity, a slave woman's helplessness, and a white woman's inability to defy the social and legal constraints that kept her bound to her husband, regardless of his transgressions. And so it was this rarely acknowledged series of repetitive relationships played out on the bodies of black women, which, if unearthed and deconstructed, would be the backstory to the construction of a new nation. 
Similarly, in the often told story of Toni Morrison's discovery of the Margaret Garner case, the foundation for her novel, Beloved, there is the sliver of the archive leaving indelible footprints across time. But more than the impetus for her 1987 Pulitzer Prize winning work, Margaret Garner's story illustrates the too much that Morrison attempts to explore in many of her novels. Because of the heightened visibility of the famous case that also existed in the dense shadows of American miscegenation, I'd like to read the historical archive into Morrison's novel so that we may explore Beloved's purposeful exploration of the violence that attends slavery's remains. In the repetitive afterimage of corporeal imperialism that accompanies known slave mothers and unknown white fathers, we first have Margaret Garner, marked everywhere in the historical archive as mulatto, then at least two of her four children. These indiscriminate markings that fail to clarify originary patrilineage are also central to the too much that Margaret Garner experienced, but about which she was forced to stay silent, at least in the public record. So of course she did not testify for herself in the trial. The ubiquitous nature of these absented patrilineal details keeps the haunted quality of, sa of slavery's force as something that happens organically and without the benefit of will. The monstrous intimacies Christina Sharp contends are the original trauma and the subsequent repetitions. This original trauma reflects both the repetition of absence, invisible patriarchy, as well as hyper-visible mechanization, biracial and multiracial offspring that sprinkle each plantation with loaded meaning. By the time Margaret Garner enters the lexicon of the historical record, she is the young mother, 23 years old, of four children, three of whom were su suspected to have been fathered by her owner, Archibald Gaines. Before Archibald, there was John Gaines, possible father of Margaret, thus making Archibald Gaines her paternal uncle. And yet none of this figures cleanly into the archive, since the archive is overwhelmed with the sensationalism of the 1856 trial. Margaret Garner and her husband escaped from Gaines's Kentucky plantation with four children late in January of 1856, crossing the Ohio River, which was frozen at the time, and entering Ohio, a free state. They are quickly caught and taken into custody, but not before Garner manages to kill one of her four children, a daughter who was three years old. The sensational court case that followed had all of the elements of national shame. A young mother so unwilling to be enslaved that she instead attempts to kill her children and herself in order to prevent this from continuing. Since she succeeds in killing one of her children, the legal questions concerning maternity, property, sentience, and personhood all coalesce around the Garner case. Garner is married, but it is evident that all of her children do not belong to her husband, Robert. The subtext of the Garner's decision to run away has the too much of the slave system in the U.S. at its center. With the unveiling of the details of Margaret Garner's life, the excesses of slavery's hypocrisies rise to the forefront. If Margaret Garner, mulatto, had little bearing on an examination of her circumstance, then her dead daughter, described as nearly white, might intimate an important part of the equation that Garner, as a slave woman, was unable to testify about during her trial. Patricia Williams in The Alchemy of Race and Rights famously tries to envision the world of her great-great-grandmother, a slave purchased at 11 years old by the man who will impregnate her almost immediately. So she gives birth for the first time when she's 12. Since then, I have tried to piece together what it must have been like to be my great-great-grandmother, she writes. She was purchased, according to matrilineal recounting, by a man who was extremely temperamental and quite wealthy. I try to imagine what it would have been like to have a discontented white man by me after a fight with his mother about prolonged bachelorhood. I wonder what it would have been like to have a 35-year-old man own the secrets of my puberty, which he bought to prove himself sexually as well as to increase his livestock of slaves. This is the imagistic trace of slavery's delineation, the imprint of both master and slave, and the willful blindness that attends an, a guilty nation state built on the very bodies of the very slaves it tries desperately not to see. Beloved disallows this blindness by sprinkling the text with disparate narratives of problematic sexualization. 
from Ella's year-long captivity where she was passed between a father and a son. You couldn't think up, Ella says, what them two done to me. To baby Suggs's hopeful trading of sexual favors for the future possession of her children. And this also fails, as she's not allowed to have any of them. Even as the protagonist, Setha, receives sparse information about her mother from a friend who traveled with her from across the sea, she finds that her mother survived multiple acts of sexual exploitation that shaped her inclinations toward motherhood. The Margaret Garner case, fixed as it was on the death of Garner's young daughter, nevertheless present, presented the American public with a visual conundrum, a slave woman, property, not person under the law, accused of killing her child, property, destroying property. In the coded but horrifically specific language of the auction block, white men delineated the force of their will, the remnants of resistance to that will, and the after effects of their immense and repeating dominion. Central to this force is that self-same proximity and familiarity that breeds insidiously, moving through blacks and whites with dizzying speed and a seeming lack of accountability. Christina Sharp writes, slavery provides both a time and space, real and fantastic, where to commit incest or amalgamation is to break the same law. Margaret Garner suffered beneath both the legible trace Marianne Doan articulates as the photographic afterimage and the deferred effect of that trace that cauterizes her memory to the footnote of history and attempts to hold it there visibly. And I think without Beloved, we really would not have a conversation about Margaret Garner in this way. Along with the sensationalism associated with the case and the sexual connotations of that sensationalism, there was the corresponding visual imagery of which Thomas Satterwhite Noble's Margaret Garner is the most famous. Noble's 1867 painting featured the slave mother in an agitated state immediately after the attempted murder of all of her children. The painting features a young male child as deceased instead of a female child, he's also much bigger. I don't know why. Discovered by the white men who represent civilized order to the racial chaos and, mon and monstrosity, the gruesomeness of the image is, according to Leslie Firth, a measure of Noble's racial guilt and his inability to fully humanize his black subjects in the painting. Garner's frenzied demeanor, Firth contends, does little to dispel the viewer's response of horror. In fact, Garner's image falls within the lexicon of contemporary representations that crudely lampooned and grotesquely exaggerated the black body and physiognomy in minstrel shows and in popular illustration. Morrison explores the capacities of the grotesque by structuring her novel around Setha's murderous act that is also an indictment of slavery, racial hegemony, patriarchy, and the limits of refusal. Noble enacts a refusal within his own painting, seemingly unwilling to paint the scene as a scene presented itself. Instead, there is the dark and monstrous mother, her equally dark, dead, and injured children, mostly boys. There is an absence of the visual possibility of previous sexual violence or exploitation, just the subtext of a slave woman with apparently inherent violent intent. Noble did not, perhaps could not, create an image of Garner in 1867 within the sentimentalized rhetoric of motherhood, Firth contends. Instead, he presents the viewer with a vengeful scene of horror, initiated and extended by the supremely powerful figure of black womanhood, so this painting is all, also called the modern Medea. What is left, awkwardly, violently, is the afterimage of these interactions, and the only evidence that anything at all has taken place. Ingrid Pollard, in her 1987 <coughs> series, Pastoral Interlude, engages explicitly with the divergent inheritances of empire, race, and conquest. Everything that has taken place outside of the purview of the official record. She does so by subjecting her body to the iterations of the this has been, Roland Barthes reminds us, exists in each photographic display. The this, Pollard highlights, forces the eye to contend with the uncomfortable nature of the photographer's self-stance in the face of the British Empire. She does not enact a refusal as the mechanism of her engagement. She stands against a constructed stone wall, alone on the edge of an English countryside. Her body becomes the boundary marker she reinforces in the photograph, upright, rigid, and awkwardly integrated. The place she cannot go is into the countryside. 
Her unbelonging is marked and mediated, measured and delineated. A legacy of slavery has brought her to this space so that her body can signal an internal conflict. And so as the corresponding image illustrates, she seems to have abandoned her quest altogether. Her form measures starkly against the foliage of the underbrush beneath her feet, and her expression might be described as caught somewhere between an introspective contemplation and a mournful fixation. The written narrative that accompanies both images is intended to further discomfort, to provide the lush landscape with violent intent. What Ulrich Baer regards in the context of Holocaust memory, landscape, and photography as un the uncoupling of seeing and knowing gestures toward what he calls, quote, deep doubts about the possibility and limitations of mastering past events by integrating them into an account of an individual's or a collective's path toward their present position, end quote. Doubt renders Co Pollard's scene as a racial extension of the interplay between an invisible imperial power and its colonized after image. What is left of the foliaged fecundity clusters of leaves and grass, trees and branches, is the body of the other, frozen and still. Even the remnants of a stone wall merge seamlessly with the plant life it borders, so much so that Pollard seems a conspicuous vertical line forming out of the wooden poles that frame her seated body. Head turned to her right and manually winding the film back into its canister with her back to a barbed wired blockage, Parl Pollard exacts a handheld reversal of the scene that she has just offered the viewer. That scene. And landscape as ruin is enacted through this post-colonial body. With Afro-Cuban artist Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, sea waves envelop her, fragmenting her form. From the neckline through the waist, she embodies the Atlantic Ocean, its organic properties, and the mechanized reproduction via the bodies of milk the bottles of milk, sorry, draped around her neck, facilitated by and through slavery's birth and rebirth. She occupies the bifocality of the black diaspora, the left and right hemispheric alignment that locates itself on black women's bodies. In this self-portrait, other bodies enter the frame with compost ponds. They slip in under the rubric of black Atlantic haunting. Since the image also invokes the Yoruba riverine deity, Yemaya, there is an otherworldly element here that conflates the temporal demarcation of slavery's transmission. In the circular logic surrounding slavery's eternal return, oceans meet bodies in flux and alter the trajectory, the sway and the movement of the transatlantic slave trade. I am interested in the rhythm and extension of this movement, in the many disparate locations that allow it to glide through cartographies of violence that, and this is Paul Gilroy speaking here, though they were unspeakable, were not inexpressible. In the multi multiple temporal possibilities engendered by the production of slavery in the New World, I focus on those that hover as they drift, a skulking metaphor for the past that is, according to Christina Sharp, not yet past. Faulkner too, but you know. Um, <laughs> in doing so, I do not offer a definitive and linear trajectory of cultural production in the Americas but instead a gathering of archival intent, that which place, places all of the conflations and displacements of the visual at the center of contemporary engagements. And so when people ask me about my archive, I just say I, I look for things that look to me like, like the haunting that Beloved is. And Beloved is the central text, Beloved is the ocean, all of the other texts are tributaries. Violet's important question what was the one and final thing she had not been able to endure or repeat? Proceeds a visual carousel containing the catalog of abuses her mother sustained while everyone watched, believing that she could endure her lot. Morrison highlights in this literary moment, playing out like a series of cinematic vignettes, that Violet's mother's descent was witnessed yet unacknowledged. It is Violet who thereafter guards her body against infliction of any kind, who in the end is able to project her mother's history onto her own and retrieve her subjectivity from the subjectivity of others. My book explores those resonances black women have been tethered to as the after image of slavery and its attendant corporeal subjections, dismantling the rhetoric of strength in literary and visual representations of race and gender, 
affords a unique opportunity to place artistic productions at the center of collective memory. Rose Deer, Violet's mother, ends her life in that tiny well, quote, a place so narrow, so dark, it was pure breathing relief to see her stretched in a box, end quote. This space is uninhabitable, a dark and narrow existence black women recognize in all of its impossible containment and hyper-invisibility. And therein lies the difficulty in attempting to wrest black women from the framework of the corporeal. Where could, he, where could they go without bringing the past along with them? Where would we let them go without our perception of their body's utility in an ocular world? <laughs> Repetition, echo, vibration, reverberation, return. I want to end my talk here by thinking through the multimodal resonance of slavery's memory functioning in the contemporary. Of the thousands of sorrow songs created and sung by unknown and uncredited, uncredited enslaved workers in the United States, this one has a particularly gendered reverberation. Motherless child, was likely written by slave women to express the enormous loss they felt toiling on disparate and scattered plantations in the United States and beyond its borders. In this a cappella version of the song by Sweet Honey in the Rock, arranged and with lead vocals by Carol Maylard, slight alterations in the, ly in the lyrics offer us a lament that actually goes beyond the boundary marker of the United States. And so twice the speaker implores this child to cross the water and get back home. In the language of mother loss and the violent extraction of children from their mothers, we have to reckon with the trauma of the motherless child as well as their natural corollary, the childless mother. The most universal definition of the slave is a stranger, Sadia Hartman writes, torn from kin and community, exiled from one's country, dishonored and violated, the slave defines the position of the outsider. She is the perpetual outcast, the coerced migrant, the foreigner, the shame-faced child in the lineage. Many of us are here because they were there, a long way from home, feeling as if they were almost gone. They labored in isolation and in groups with few avenues of release of which this song and its agonizing construction is just one example. This one song can help us see them in the complex alignment of the slave system, its horrors and repetition, its disregard for humanity, its corporeal precision. Like the figure in the image on the cover of the book, black women must somehow cross the ocean and embody its capacities. They must be contained and also somehow expansive. They must reproduce and be reproducible. They must find a way out of no way and negotiate the space between the horrors of here and the drifting memory of over there, knowing that everything that they create will be taken from them. They must do all of this with reprieves that are too few and too far between, for they labored without an end on the horizon, and therein lies the echo, the ache, the vibration, the reiteration, the response, the return, and the call, always the call.
And this book represents just one part of the story they have always told, whether or not anyone was listening. And yes, we are here because they were there, somewhere between the release of a belief in a better future and the reality of their present condition. They left us everything that they had. Thank you. Now I'm going to attempt to ask you thoughtful questions. It's kind of a hard, hard act to follow. If you would join me on stage. So funny how I want to take my technology with me. It's no, it's weird. perfectly safe here. <laughs> Wow, um, what an incredible presentation. Thank you. Like every presentation I see you give. So we are in the midst of a process here at Georgetown University to think about the very questions that are at the center of your work of what we remember and what we fail to see. Mm -hmm. And in the process of writing this book, I know that you visited Monticello, you yes. told me the stories, right. and you visited other sites in which this question of memory mm -hmm. and, its, and its uses and its purpose in the contemporary are always at odds and at the same time are usually in very beautiful places. Yes. I think that one of the things that Monticello reminds you is just how beautiful and graceful, mm -hmm. right? This system allowed right. places to be. And so in thinking about the different sites that you have visited, mm -hmm. what are some of the ways that memorials are refusing to see or acknowledge the past? Oh my gosh, great question. So there's not an, an enthusiastic memorialization <laughs> that I see taking place. And I can't say that it's much different. So I also do research in Brazil and I can, but I can do that anywhere I go. I see a building and I know if a slave made it or lived there or, you know, I can tell and that's just because of the kind of work that I do. But the Contemporary Museum in Salvador de Bahia, in Brazil, is, is on the grounds of a sugar plantation. Yes. And you just have to kind of go there and either know that or you will swiftly figure it out by the way that this space is framed. I find that to be a remarkable and extremely haunted site that almost can't get away from the overarching visualization of slavery, even though it works really hard. It's actually quite beautiful. But, for instance, there's a outdoor cafe. It's on the water. Yes. But there's also this sugar wheel left over that just kind of looks like a construction, and you wouldn't attach it to slavery, except I sat in that cafe with two other black women, one African woman and one woman from Trinidad, and the three of us did not know, but sitting for an hour, we were just creeped out. We didn't know why. And then we figured out that that was actually the dungeon. Like, if you go to the bathroom, that's where you see the dungeon. And I asked in my terrible Portuguese where the archive for the museum was. And they told me, oh, it's not, it's not here, it's in Sao Paulo. So they don't even have at the site what the site used to be. But that site, unlike Monticello, I think, screams sugar plantation. Whereas Monticello looks like a really vibrant farm that also had some slaves there maybe, but we're not really sure. I know I've gone, I went three or four years ago, and I know that Monticello has worked, apparently hard, to include <laughs> slaves in the history of Monticello. But what I saw when I went there was the African burial ground where they had found enough bones to make 40 people, enough bones to make 40 people, mm -hmm. and those slaves' names are listed if they can find them. And that was really it. And then a lot of placards that said, Jefferson abhorred slavery. He thought it was a terrible, terrible sin. He inherited his slaves. And I feel like I'm always saying to my students, 
that when Thomas Jefferson is winking at Martha Wales Skelton, he's also winking at the 150 slaves she brings into the marriage. That he's interested in her, of course, also for this reason, and that he's not a reluctant slave master. He depended very heavily on his, on the, on his slaves for his, his, um, his life and his luxuries, because he bought a lot of fairly unnecessary things, but that is what slavery kind of affords you, right? I think Jefferson is a great figure to, to think through, to pay attention to the archive and to think through. But I was really struck by how large that plantation is, the 5,000 acres. It starts out as a tobacco plantation. That's finger-breaking, back-breaking work. How um, he wanted none of the seams to show. So I, try, I sat on one of the benches and tried to imagine how far a slave had to walk with water buckets because he didn't want the piping to be too, he didn't want the well to be too close to the home because everything was about the construction. It says America to me. So I think Monticello as a site is a perfect place for us to investigate, but asking very different questions, right? So after 1998, I know that the, the site acknowledges that one of Sally Hemings' children likely belonged to Jefferson. That's what you get on the tour. And I did it twice to make sure it's kind of the same thing that they say. But before 1998, the answer was the same. The script was, all of the prominent historians of Thomas Jefferson agree that this did not happen. So after 1998, it becomes either a binary between never happened or a greatest love story, never told. Those are your options and there's nothing in between. I do think, because I've been asked at talks, what is the alternative? And I think the alternative is to have slavery scholars who are interested in slaves give the tour at Monticello. I would love to give a tour at Monticello. Do you think that will happen anytime soon? My lifetime? <laughs> no. One of the... Probably not. I remember very early in your career you gave a paper about Sally Hemings and thinking about our ability to register her visually. Right. And you showed the way that in popular fiction, there were these different types of very sexualized imaginings of mm -hmm. Sally Hemings. There was the movie uh, Jefferson in Paris with Halle yes. Berry. Um, Halle Berry, oh my God, Tandy uh, Newton. Tandy Newton, I'm sorry. That would, oh, Halle Berry was in Queen, I'm sorry. Whole other, That's yes. Another, how could I tell the difference? Um, I mean, but I mean, so it's this, hard. But it's an, it's, an, it's an imagining of black women in slavery. Mm -hmm. And I guess the most recent, thing that we have now is there's a Nat Turner movie. I don't know if there's any women in it. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. But mm -hmm. I think that one of the things that you're touching upon that's so um, relevant for our conversations today is about the ability to see blacks as um, actually um, subjects of pain, mm -hmm. right? That a lot of the conversation about police brutality and police killings, especially mm -hmm. involving children, is an inability to see them as children or an inability to see black vulnerability. Right. Right. And so when we think about how we memorialize right. slavery, mm -hmm. there is this tension between the triumphant and then the, the kind of everyday small resistance or no resistance mm -hmm. of the system. And so mm -hmm. what are some of the dangers in the way that we try to imagine um, slavery as a site of memorialization or a site of pride or a story that has to feel good at the end of it? Yeah. So I think that one, one of the dangerous things is trying to locate it spatially. There's just nowhere you can go in this country that is not touched by slavery. So I think it's hard to attempt to maybe um, produce a space that says, we recognize these slaves worked here and we're going to put a plaque here. Because I think it gives people the idea that if it happened here, it did not happen across the street. And I would want to disabuse them of that notion. I don't really know. I never have a good answer for where should the memorial be because I went to the museum in Liverpool and I left after like 12 minutes. It was like, it, it really does try to contain 500 years in a space about this size. It's not possible and it's clearly um, speaking to the US uh, and not all of these other, for the British Empire, not really speaking to all these other areas. And it is telling a story that was like, here's a beginning, here's the end, applause, applause, self-congratulatory, it's over. So because I want to resist those narratives, I had to, I, I use the song because I was actually 
my African American literature class, we use a lot of music because they, they have no historical context about the um, slave spirituals. But this one in particular is so often remade, like you know somebody who has, who has sung that song. Mm -hmm. I think it's odd that white people sing this song in particular. Interesting. But a lot of them do. Like there are a few of these maybe sorrow songs that might make sense in a very contemporary moment, but I haven't heard this version, but I know that Van Morrison has done a mother's talk. So because it comes from slavery, I think that's one of the slippages that can occur when you don't focus on who made the songs and why, and why it's important, and then treat it like a sacred text instead of something that can be applied to. And that's not to say that white people can't sing sorrow songs. It's just that song in particular, that amount of excruciating pain attempting to be rendered and through musically and then passed on seems to me to be one, one of these moments where you're supposed to like contemplate who made it and why. And that's a good memorial that is not a space that maybe, you know, thinking about that since there are so many of these songs. Like I could just teach a class just on that, though I don't work on music. So I wouldn't do that. So I'm, I'm not anti-monument. I just, I do not know what a good solution is. I mean, remember Morrison says, beloved has to be the, the monument, right? And then Morrison, Morrison says, there's no bench in the road. There's no place I can go to contemplate slavery. And then Morrison society, I believe, make her a bench in the road. She was not being literal. So, <laughs> so, when, they, so when they do that, now there is a bench in the road. And there's also beloved, but it's not. Like, this has to be something that we think about on a daily basis. And so as this institution um, moves forward in its contemplative stage, mm -hmm. what are some of the feedback that you would give to any institution that is trying to be thoughtful and deliberate mm -hmm. and um, manage their expectations about what a process right. like this can be about? You may have heard about it in the New York Times. I did, <laughs> on my way here. <laughs> Such a surprise. Well, it wasn't a surprise, but it's like, you know, who's like not got, slavery's kind of everywhere. I, I'm constantly saying, if you study slavery, you study everything. You study labor, production, reproduction, gender, race, everything is, the, everything, everything is located there, trauma. So I think what institutions like Georgetown can do is to have very different disciplinary frameworks to look at the same archive. So what you're saying is that our role as a site of the production of knowledge could perhaps be the best way we approach thinking about the problem of slavery? Right? <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? Because I will look at it very differently from the way that you look at mm -hmm. this, the very same archive. And what, what we find together there might be um, a spectacular you know, production of everything that could be found in an archive and could be located and could be thought about in an archive. Well, with that, I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, any questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Darden? Hi. Oh. Oh, I'm okay. Hello. Oh. Hello. <clears throat> More bass. There we go. So, when we think about slavery in entertainment, mm -hmm. we have underground, we have a remake of Roots. Mm -hmm. uh, there's books, I mean, Toni Morrison, before, after. Yeah. And there's the inevitable social media pushback of, well, why do we need another slavery show? Why do we need, you know, why, why can't we, you know, from, from black communities. Right. I disagree with that. Right. But do you, in academia, get that sort of pushback also? Mm. Why do you have to study <laughs> this? Wow, that's like a Tuesday afternoon for me. So um, <laughs> it came out of African American Studies and American Studies, and it was always like we were very like a heavily post 1960s. Why are you bringing up old stuff that's in the past, right? Forward, right? Forward thinking, futurity. Um, so it was almost as if you were dredging up some pain that did not need to be dredged up because it was all understood. I thought if you put black women in the center of slavery studies, it's a completely other way of looking at slavery, which at the time that I was starting my research was heavily masculine and still kind of is. So I already had a reason for why I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it. 
I am genuinely surprised, and I cannot believe I'm going to say this, but Django Unchained may have begun a process of people accepting the idea that you could represent in the popular media slavery and the whole country wouldn't burn to the ground. I think behind the fear and the concern is the country will burn to the ground, right? So I, I don't watch any of it. Right. Because I, I don't like the fictionalization of history. Have you seen Underground? No, I do not have the television anymore. I have, you don't have a the TV? Apple TV. Are you kidding me? I have no way to. People have been trying to give me codes, but I... So are, but are you I'm resisting watching it? Because I don't want to watch it. I am resisting it. watching it. I don't know how you make a TV show. Apparently it's good, though. People like it a lot. I can't. I'm going to wait. This is how I feel about civil rights movies. I just can't. Right? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but, maybe, but maybe we're the problem. We might be the problem. I, I, I think we're the problem. I think we're the problem. Well, clearly people are having a very different... Con according to social media, there's a very different conversation taking place that I couldn't have anticipated 10 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Starting over, I want to say thank you. That was just an extraordinary oh. speech and it makes me excited to read the book. Thank you. Very much. I'm speaking in this building, which I believe named for Healy. Reverend Father Healy was the son of a, an enslaved woman mm -hmm. with her master who lived as man and wife. What? So at Georgetown, I don't think it's even, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. It's not internalized that the founding name, or at least not founding, but one of the most um, influential people building this university mm -hmm. was in fact in danger of being enslaved, by law would have been a slave. Wow. And his father and mother were in a master slave position, and technically you'd call him black, which right. I don't think Georgetown well, internalizes at well, all. There's, well, there's a history of when Father Healy becomes black that's also, really, that's also very reflective of the time. So there's a, there's a great story about when, when he becomes the first African-American president of an institution like this, Wait right? It's, it's a Christian. He was the president of Georgetown University? Yeah. He was, yeah. And he was black. For many years. Yeah, but he was like passing. <laughs> right? Does yeah. that... That's already so fascinating. So my other... It, yeah. My other question isn't so much a question as hoping for a little illumination. I'm coming at this as not a scholar but a producer, and I actually mm -hmm. did one of the series on the Civil War with Ken Burns oh. 30 years ago. And yeah. this past year I spent on a fellowship trying to rethink what we saw and what we showed. Right. And I kept wondering why I didn't know more about the actual experience of enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So I went looking mm -hmm. visually to see what I could uh, locate and it, not not just amnesia, but almost an intentional right. desire by anyone not to draw this, show it, right. represent it in any visual form, right. even when photography's around. It's right. still like very little. Yeah. And I thought we made a movie about a war, not about slavery. Mm -hmm. So it focused on what there were photos of a lot of white soldiers. Right. But if I were to do that again, I think we'd rip it up. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know where there are, ar if there are archives. I've been finding things that are usually Europeans doing illustrations or people using a very political image, mm -hmm. blacks in chains by the Capitol, but very specifically from historical memory, but used for a, a abolitionist broadsides. Yes. Final thing is I worked in a house right down the street here, which with Anna Devere Smith, this sounds name droppy, I don't mean <laughs> that, but 20 years ago, and we spent a lot of time researching and found out later the house we were in mm -hmm. was owned by a woman who owned several slaves. And she wrote about that. There's just a, mm -hmm. a re repetition is the only word. Right. The archive is everywhere. There's just nowhere where it doesn't exist, especially in this country. Is there a visual, are, there, are there any other visual sources that, are, that could represent it? Because that's, mm. so, we chose um, not to show it. Right. Is a country. Exactly. We, the self-curating in these here United States is remarkable, of course. Um, so I've been looking for photographs of black soldiers in uniform on the battlefield during the Civil War. I have not found any yet. I am still looking because there's such a proliferation of white soldiers as if, I mean, the idea is, as it is constructed photographically and historically, 
This is a war where white soldiers, Confederate or Union, died for the sin that was slavery that is also a sin of black people. So like they died for black people's sin. That's why I think, I suspect, that black soldiers are absent. They are not absent in the photographic archive. They just don't exist on the battlefield as if they didn't fight. So the 180,000 soldiers who were there, who were present, there's just no visual archive. I find that fascinating. And I can read through what is present in the archive and, and talk about the absences. I have no problem doing that because I am a gender scholar. So, <laughs> so I feel very comfortable there. I also feel comfortable because I have so much material created in the very last, the last 30 or 40 years that tries to speak to these absences. So the Karen May Williams piece is really a, like a fascinating read on Thomas Jefferson, on photography, on Sally Hemings being completely absent visually, you know? Even though she's, she's described by several people, several different people describing what she looks like, but she's just not present, but I can use that, you know? Sometimes the absences or the slippages, you know something is there, but it's not there. You can read through that, you can use that. And if we think about archive, um, part of what the working group has done under the leadership of my colleague, Adam Rothman, whose new book also um, looks at um, slavery in New Orleans, um, is about having a very thoughtful and organized way in which to think about the archive. The documents are there, right? So how do we curate them in a way so that scholars can and, and documentarians like yourself can enter the text in a way that is, that is clear? And I think that this question of how you would make that movie now, mm -hmm. you know, that movie is made differently because Kimberly exists, right? And her cohort exists. And mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is why the work we do within the academy and the training of scholars is so important because it fundamentally shifts the conversation. If we can think about the best example of this is the fact that we are in an election season in which people across the aisle are talking about mass incarceration. Right. I never thought I would never. live to see the day, right? But scholars had to set the agenda and the tone in which they reframe the conversation. And I think the history of slavery is, is similar in that regard. Yes, Laura. <laughs> there is. And is it on? Okay, it is. Kimberly, as usual, I, you make me wish I knew shorthand <laughs> so that I could copy down every single phrase because it is just poetry. Thank you so much. Um, I, in the phrases that I did copy down, I wrote um, that the archive is overwhelmed by the sensationalism of the case. Mm -hmm. I wrote um, hyper invisible attempting to arrest the woman from the ocular world. Mm -hmm. And I wrote um, about practices of looking. Mm -hmm. And my question is leading towards um, spectacularism mm -hmm. and how it just attaches to the black body. Right. And I suppose uh, leading towards the question of like, what kind of practices of looking could you recommend? Could we adopt mm -hmm. as a nation? Mm -hmm. um, I know, huge question, right? Like huge, but like you just gave a huge talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, if, you, if you could perhaps grab like an example, a contemporary example that you think might be a way that, that would illustrate a different practice of looking that like you think right. would be recommendable. So, okay, so I'll say this. I had, um, I was on a panel, a round table, and it was about um, feminist strategies in the classroom. And I um, presented as an idea caveats, which I do put on my syllabi, not trigger warnings. And my explanation was, people think black people can't be triggered. So trigger warnings seem to apply to a lot of people, but not black people, for instance. Why is a moving video of Tamir Rice mm. being shot by police seen everywhere, impossible to be seen everywhere? And my, um, my query is always, can you find this happening to a white child in this country? If the answer is no, that's a practice of looking. That's a practice of expectation. And that's the idea that people have that um, clearly, and that's why Elizabeth Alexander's essay is called, Can You Be Black and Look at This? Clearly, it can be looked at, but should it be looked at? And so maybe we, we need to have a conversation about how we envision uh, black humanity 
in this country. And I think that I never have to say things like Black Lives Matter because my work is always already about that. But that, that means that you have to like sit with whatever particular archive you're, you're looking at. And right now we're talking about an archive that locates black people as fungible and then locates that fungibility as a moving video that you can see anytime you want to on YouTube, which should be immediately shut down by, by any of the surveillance mechanisms we have at play at any time, but isn't. And that makes me think that too many people are comfortable with these extreme acts of violence that comes out of a history of slavery and a history of value until your body is not valuable anymore in its laboring capacity. That's why mass incarceration looks like it does. That's why these images look like they do. So maybe a refusal, because I, I feel like for my second project, which is about images of the dead on the cover of the New York Times in, 94, in 1994, I constantly get asked the question, and it's not really a question, it's more of an accusation. You mean to tell me there are no images of white people dead on the cover? And I'm like, find them for me, send them to me. I'd love to see them. I haven't, found, I haven't seen them. So if you already know that that engagement is taking place and that a newspaper like the New York Times wouldn't dare show an image of somebody who could be rendered as white, dead on the cover of the newspaper, then you already know what is taking place. And that means that you just have to acknowledge that and articulate some other solutions. One of the things that you say, um, I think you're in reference to the song, is if we treated the song as sacred text, mm -hmm. what happens? And so if we could think about some of these images as a sacred text mm -hmm. that, are, that are only to be um, thought of in a contemplative space, how does this change our relationship to these acts of looking and voyeurism that are so central to right. understanding black pain? Right. Um, I think that is a really fascinating yes. idea about what we do with it and what we do with a space like this, right, that is built on slave labor. If we think of it as a sacred space, how do we reconfigure mm -hmm. the relationships that happen on the campus? Right. Um, any, yes, Father Kep. Spectacular. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm, it's still all kind of bouncing around in my head. I can look out this window and see an island named after mm -hmm. Roosevelt, Theodore, and it is the place where the African American troops were quartered during the Civil War. I mean, you can see it from here. It was a segregated group of oh. that window, I think. Um, we have a relationship with these spaces, these places, Georgetown does, just mm -hmm. by sitting here this long. Um, Frank Smith, against all kinds of odds, put together an African-American Civil War mm -hmm. Museum along Vermont Avenue. He's mm -hmm. had a hard time keeping that afloat and mm -hmm. alive and well. It's, um, it's in the back of a D.C. public school, which I think is now being used by the police and fire. But I know he's wow. got images. Yeah. Frank's got some that that ought to be of um, right. those Civil War types. That's one little contribution I can make. And oh, that's great. Frank is, um, he's an incredible guy who has had his shoulder to the plow for a long time. I, I just think our spaces here, I, I love the thing about the text being sacred and the mm -hmm. songs being sacred and motherless child, you did it for me. But these spaces are incredible. I mean, people mm -hmm. got to a wall out there and stopped. There's a church out there that the outdoor stairway was taken down mm -hmm. where the blacks had to go into the choir loft and the then pastor was gonna trace it along the floor when they renovated the mm -hmm. chapel, but we haven't done those kinds of things. Right. Just the kinds of things that you, you can't walk 20 right. feet here without bumping into what it is that we are talking about yeah. this week and this time. And there has to be some way to lift it up. And I think it's visual. I think it's mm -hmm. oral. I think it's the kind of conversations that we're having here. And I think mm -hmm. this is a spectacular way to begin. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> I, agree to, I agree with all that. I think that we're going to thank our guest, Kimberly Juanita Brown.
So yes, thank you. Um, on behalf of, of the university, on behalf of the working group, on behalf of everybody in this library, thank you so very much. I, I don't think anybody is under the illusion that this is a complicated story, but can I add one little factoid since the Patrick Healy story came up? And uh, so Patrick Healy, his father's name was, the plantation owner was, the, was Michael, and uh, the mother's name, the enslaved woman, was Mary Smith. Uh, they had nine children. Three of them, boys, became priests. At a certain point when Michael Healy was uh, getting his will prepared, he realized that his children, as mixed-race children, uh, would be in danger of being enslaved. And so he has to name a, uh, a protector, should there, a white person, should it come to some sort of legal case where their enslavement would be reasserted. The protector was Thomas Milady, who is the man who uh, organized the sale that is one of the inspiring moments behind the founding of the working group. Um, and, uh, and he was named this sort of legal protector or guardian after the slave sale while Milady was in, his, in a later job uh, president of Holy Cross. So it's a, it's a complicated and tragic story. I think that the, you know, the, the metaphor we use for slavery is one of family, right. of a disgusting, sick, twisted family in which um, behavior is never consistent and everyone is, is, has these, these kin ties that are legal and they're emotional and they're destructive. And so I think that that's probably the best illustration right. of those complicated relationships. Precisely. Right. So again, thank you very much. Uh, we'll break now. The next event also takes place here in Riggs. It begins at 3 o'clock. Uh, the theme is freedom in the 21st century, and it brings together four of the recent recipients of the John Thompson Jr. Legacy of a Dream Award, which is given to members of the extended uh, community who are recognized for being women or men for others. So I look forward to seeing you at 3 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>